this time, Juliana will come and read a text for this morning, Judges 6, 1 through 10. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains, and caves, and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For they, both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drove them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Juliana. When God seems far away, you ever experience that? Many Christians say they have. Do you personally ever go through times when God seems far away? Have you felt as though you've been abandoned by God? Or that he's not answering your prayers? Or that he is totally oblivious to your circumstances? Do you ever go through seasons in your spiritual life when you sit through worship service Sunday after Sunday feeling as though you're totally detached spiritually and are wondering if anyone notices or if anyone has ever experienced the same thing? Well, if you have, I assure you, you're not alone. The truth is, every Christian goes through seasons of dryness, seasons of feeling distant from God. So the title is, What to Do When God Seems Far Away, but we're going to be more precise. That is, steps we can take when God seems far away and explanations of why that happens. So yes, there are dry seasons in our life when God seems far away. Times, even when we haven't sinned, we know we're walking with the Lord the best we can. We haven't done anything wrong. We've asked God to search us. There's nothing there. But yet, nonetheless, we can't shake it. God seems to be far away. We cry to him, and it seems that he doesn't hear us. Once again, all of us have had these desert times. Turn to Psalm 16, and we see David crying out to God. Now, exegetes look at this passage, and uh, David was not in sin. When he wrote this, and yet, even though David was not in sin, he hadn't committed sin when he wrote this, he felt God was far away. Here's what he writes. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed against him. Let those who troubled me rejoice when I am moved. But then, even in this, even when he felt God was far away, God wasn't listening, even during that time. Look at verses 5 and 6. He says, but I have trusted in your mercy. Past tense, leading up to the present. And he goes on to say, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Even when he was going through this, he said, my heart will rejoice in your salvation. Now, the word salvation here is not salvation of his soul, but physical deliverance from his circumstances, what he was going through, preservation. He says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Isn't that interesting? Even when he felt God wasn't hearing his prayer, he was surrounded by his enemies. Even then, even then, he said, I'm going to keep trusting. I'm going to believe God for deliverance and restoration. And I recognize that God has dealt bountifully with me. God has blessed me. We see a thankful heart, even in all of this. Uh, such a wonderful response to God being far away. As we go on, remembering what David said, we have Habakkuk. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 1. And Habakkuk was pretty down. And God didn't seem to be answering prayer for him. There was no sin in Habakkuk's life at this time. What was happening is the nation of Judah was so wicked, they were getting away with all kinds of sin. And God didn't seem to be doing anything. God didn't seem to be punishing them. And he didn't know why. We read verse 2 of Habakkuk chapter 1. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Then he goes on to say, why do you show me iniquity? All this wickedness happening around me, why do I have to see it? And cause me to see trouble, for plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law, that is the law of God, is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Does this sound familiar today? The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. So he was pretty down about this. God didn't seem to be there. God didn't seem to be answering. He was crying out to God. God seemed far away. But then God answered him. Verse 5. He said, Habakkuk, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work in your days. A work which you would not believe, though, or told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans to punish the, Babylon uh, the Babylonians, to punish Judah. In other words, God did hear his prayer. God was working. God saw all the wickedness going on. God knew all about it, even though God didn't seem to be answering. And God seemed far away. So we have a principle here of truth. God is working. Very much so. He knows your situation very much so. Even though he may seem to be absent and not hear your prayer, God hears 
and is active working to bring about an answer and to accomplish his purposes. So when there's no known sin in our life and we're doing our best to walk with the Lord and things seem down and bad, God hears your prayer. God is there. God is working. Don't forget it. Don't be led by your feelings. Don't be led by what you see and hear others say. Be led by God's word, objective truth. God is there. He knows what you're going through. Though he seems distant, he hears your prayer. And he is right now in the process of answering it. Wow. So even when we haven't sinned, God may be trying through all of this, believe it or not, to bring us closer to himself. When God seems distant, perhaps he's trying to bring us closer to himself, that we might learn to trust him more. Well, why is that? Well, James chapter 1 talks about our faith. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter many trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that word patience also means endurance and perseverance. That you may be perfect, that is mature in your faith. So God, in these silent moments when God doesn't seem to be there and we know we haven't done anything wrong, God may be trying to bring us closer to himself, testing our faith, teaching us patience, endurance, wanting to grow us up into maturity. Hmm. Something we don't think about sometimes. You see this, the poetess writes these words, God has not promised skies always blue, flower strewn pathways all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. God has not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. God has not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, Unfailing kindness, undying love. When God seems far away, always, always remember, he's as close as a prayer. He is there working, even though it may not seem like it. Keep trusting, believe God for deliverance, Recognize that he has dealt wonderfully and bountifully with you. But there's another reason sometimes God doesn't seem to be there. Well, it's because we really don't believe God to act and answer our prayers. God seems distant when I don't expect in faith him to answer my prayers. You see, if you expect nothing from God, you'll get it every time. In other words, the source of my dry spell might be my lack of faith and expectancy 
Remember James. We've alluded to James 1, 5 through 8. He says, The person who asks, let him ask, who gives to all men generously, liberally, without reproach, without censure or rebuke, and it will be given. So God desires to give generously in answer to your prayers. That's God's desire. But in verse 6 of James 1, he says this, There is a condition, and is often the great answer why God seems far away. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And verse 7 really drives it home. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see... Our dry times may also come from the fact that many times we don't believe our own prayers. We pray and we believe God probably won't answer. We pray, but we're doubting whether it will happen. And it tells us quite clearly in verse 7, Let not that person suppose that they'll receive anything from the Lord. If they approach me with doubts, Instead of expecting faith. So when we don't exercise that expectant faith. God doesn't answer. God seems far away. God doesn't seem to hear my prayers. Indeed. An example to me of expectant faith can be found in Psalm 42. It's a contemplation of the sons of Korah. And in this song, this psalm, this person, this man was far away from Israel. And he was surrounded by unbelievers. And they taunted him. Where's your God? Show us, where's your God? He said in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me, where's your God? He remembered the good old days when he was back in the land of Israel and how wonderful it is. And then he looked inside himself. And I like to say he gave himself a God talk. He reminded himself of God's truth. Verse 5, he says to his soul, Soul, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? So he did feel alone. God seemed distant. He did seem far away from God. He was far away from the Holy Land among pagans who questioned the presence of his God. And he asked himself, why are you cast down? Why are you bowed down literally within me? And then he says something wonderful with expectation in faith. He says this to himself. He says, self My words there. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Isn't that beautiful? So even when he was going through this, even when God seemed far away, he was having this God talk with himself, reminding himself, hey, I'm going to hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, his faith, his blessing. And then in verse 11, at the end of that psalm, he says the same thing, but one slight little change. Interesting. He asks himself again, why are you cast down on my soul and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. He reminds himself again, for I yet shall yet praise him for the help of My countenance, my faith. Remember, the first time, the help of your countenance, O Lord. You looking upon me favorably, you smiling, you showing me your grace. And that will help the help of my countenance. The salvation of my face, literally. I'll be lifted up. So you see, 
he expectantly in faith believed it. He saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, he was expecting God to answer. You know, there's another reason that's most often the reason why God seems far away. And it could be that maybe it's your reason and mine. It could be that we need some inner house cleaning. Inner house cleaning. There may be unconfessed and unrepentant sin in our life that we're not dealing with. Our sin can drive an emotional wedge and a spiritual wedge between us and God. In Isaiah 52, 59, 2, he says this, But your iniquities, he says to the people of Israel, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. God seems far away. So that he will not hear. You see, often when our hearts become entangled with disobedience, with the things of this world, God will allow us to experience a feeling of distance between us and himself. Hmm. The people of Israel should have recognized their spiritual poverty. Indeed, they continued to worship Baal without regard to the holy nature of God and his intimate love for them. Therefore, God allowed them to go through a time of testing that they might turn and come back to him. The nation of Israel sinned and drifted away from God. And that's exactly the text that was read this morning in Judges 6. This is a, a case where not I'm walking with the Lord. There's no sin in my life between myself and the Savior. I don't know why God seems far away. No, this is a case of I am deliberately sinning. I know I am. I know I shouldn't be doing this, and yet I'm doing it anyway. In Judges 6, it starts off by saying, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them in the hands of the enemy. The children of Israel, they planted crops and did everything, and the enemy would come and steal their crops and destroy things. To such an extent, in verse 6, Israel was greatly impoverished, not only in terms of material things and food and animals, but impoverished in their spirit. They were brought very, very, very low. You see, that's the ultimate result of turning our back to God and turning our face to sin. It catches up with us, and it will impoverish us. It will bring us low. And they recognized that. They cried out to God, and God sent them a prophet, and they returned back to him. You see, sin makes God distant from us. Sin brings us very, very low. Sin spiritually impoverishes us. Indeed, sin is a spiritual dryness and emptiness of the soul. I want you to turn with me in James, a New Testament text now. In James, it really talks about this in a marvelous way. By marvelous, I mean it cuts to the quick. It doesn't mince words. It's straight to the heart. This talks about worldliness. This talks about sin in our life. This talks about believers following the world. Follow along. He says, why do wars and fights, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war within your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and do not obtain. Not murder there. 
could mean murder of the heart, hating. You fight in war, yet you do not receive. Why? Because you do not ask. You do not receive because you ask a mix to spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? And a most frightening statement for the believer. Here it is. Whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't know about you, but that makes me shudder. Now, talking about believers here who have strayed, we become in practice an enemy of God. And then it goes on to say about the Holy Spirit within us, do you not think that the Spirit says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, jealously to possess us for God? But then there's a turn now. That's the problem, right? We have fighting. We have desires for pleasure. We have lusting of all kinds. We may murder in our heart. Uh, we ask, but God never hears our prayers. Uh, we're adulterers and adulteresses. We follow the world in their values. And yet, we come on church on Sunday, don't we? God says, if you want to be a friend of the world, you're not a friend of mine. Then he, he gives an answer to this. It says in verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. Oh, yes, that's the other big thing. When we follow the way of the world, we follow the way of arrogance and pride. Because that's the way of the world. That's a sin that caused Satan, that is Lucifer, to fall, Right? But he gives grace to the humble. You say, well, how do I get back and track when I know I've sinned and God seems far away? What do I do? How do I get back? How do I get restored? And he tells us here in verse 7. He first of all starts off by saying from verse 6, God gives grace to the humble. He says, submit to God. Confess. Submit to God. God, I'm going to do it your way. God, from now on, you're going to be in charge. God, I've strayed. I've sinned. I've turned away from you. I've gone out in the world there. I submit to you now. I'm yours. Take me, use me. Resist the devil. I mean, when you were following the world, you were on his turf, his territory. You follow those temptations he wanted you to be a part of. You yield to them, whether it was drinking or drugs or sexual immorality or fighting or arguing or committing murder in your heart, whatever it was. Resist the devil. It says if you do this, there's a promise here, he'll flee from you. Why? Because you first submitted to God. Remember, the devil is not afraid of you. He's afraid of Jesus in you. When you submit to God, he sees that, and that causes him to flee. Verse 8, draw near to God. That's the principle of principles, I think, in this whole message. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You take that first step. He's waiting. Draw near to him. He'll draw near to you. I'll repeat it again before I finish this message. When God seems far away, guess who moved? You did. I did. God didn't. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And then James gets very practical. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. The things you've been doing with your hands, the hands represent here sinful acts, sinful behavior, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. But then he goes over to your mind now. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Our minds, our hearts, our hands need to be cleansed. They need to be given over to God. God, I'm going to use my hands for you now. God, I'm going to give my mind to you now to serve you instead of the devil. And then he says, lament and mourn and weep. Repent. Say you're sorry. Ask for forgiveness. 
Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. And then finally he says in verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of God and he will lift you up. That's how to get back to God when he's distant because of our sin. So what have we said in this verse? It gives the problem, it gives the solution. God is distant because of our fights, because of our desires for pleasure, our lusting, murder, covetousness. We act wrongly. We're friends of the world. We're adulterers and adulteresses. We have enmity with God and we're proud. The answer we said was submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, lament and mourn and humble yourself. And he promises you will experience my love and favor, my grace. But you know the beautiful thing? Our failures don't affect God's unconditional love for us. Though we fail, he still loves us. Doesn't love what we're doing. And he'll chastise us if he needs to. Another reason is the accuser may cause us to feel far away from God. Satan planting thoughts in your mind. God doesn't love you. He doesn't care. You're all alone. The Bible isn't really true. He won't help you. You are such a sinner. You're so far away from God. You know, sometimes we buy into that. But if we look at the scriptures, we find out many promises that tell us that God is right there if we want him to be, if we draw near to him to help us. For example, Psalm 9, 10. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Even when we've sinned, we confess it, get right with God. He wants to come in again and take control. Matthew 28.20, he says, I am with you always. What a beautiful promise. Hebrews 13.5, For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4.29, he says, wherever you are, you know, when you, if you get so messed up with sin and you get so far away from me, even then, from wherever you are, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I'll hear your prayer. I'll hear your cry. And I'll meet you. You'll find me. How wonderful is that promise. So what have we said all together? We said we can drift away from God, it seems, and God seems far away, it seems. Not because we've said we're doing everything okay, but God just doesn't seem to be there, right? We've also said God doesn't seem to be there because we don't have expectant faith. We don't expect him to really answer our prayer, so he doesn't. We've also said that God is distant from us because there's sin in our life and we know it's sin and we let it stay there. And he's hidden his face from us and he cannot hear our prayers until we come back to him. So putting it all together, when we know there's no sin in our life, here's what we're to do. And God seems distant. Keep trusting no matter what. Expect God to answer when you pray. Believe God is going to deliver you. God may be drawing you in all this time, this experience, closer to him. Closer to him. Recognize how beautifully the Lord has dealt with you. How he's blessed you. Be thankful. Think about those good times. Think about how he's blessed you in so many ways. And as Habakkuk learned, God is working even when he doesn't seem to be working or doesn't seem to be there. God is working for you to bring about answered prayers. Realize that the accuser 
Satan wants to separate you from God. Don't believe his lies. And then in Psalm 42, hope in God. Give yourself a good God talk. Believe that you will yet praise him for the help of his countenance, for the help of your countenance. Believe that. But how about when you're in sin and you know you're in sin and you're guilty as sin? And God seemed far off, we've also said the solution for that. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Submit to him, resist the devil, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, repent, confess, humble yourselves before God. He never forsakes those who seek him. He won't turn you away. When we drift away, he'll be knocking on that door. He promises to be with us always. He says in his word, he'll never leave us or forsake us. Though he may seem far away, he promises, if you seek me, you will find me. So to conclude, I wrap it up with what I've said a number of times before. So when God seems far away, guess who moved? What do we need to do? In a nutshell, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Think about this in the new year. Father, thank you so much for your word, for your truth. We recognize at times you do seem far away, even when we're walking righteously with you. Definitely, Lord, when we sin. Teach us to draw near to you every day. And you promise to draw near to us. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.